Welcome to Open Book, Episode 11. How to read Shakespeare's villains, focusing on Aaron from Titus Andronicus. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary. And today's topic is the second in a three-part series on Shakespeare's villains, the first on Richard III, and the one after this on Iago from Othello. Each episode examines one villain's characteristics, language, and role in their genre, namely tragedy or history. These episodes are different from my usual format, in their focus on a single character from one or more of Shakespeare's plays. They're also a little less formally structured than others this season, with fewer musical interludes and a more conversational style. As in my last presentation on Richard of Gloucester, there's going to be three parts to this today's talk. One, it's going to be focusing on three facets, I should say, of uh, Aaron's villainy. The first is what his motives were. The second is how he is an alienated from, pushed away from the mainstream of the story of the play, the world of the play. And most of our focus is going to be on Aaron's rhetorical style, his way of presenting himself through words. Let's begin by focusing on the genre of Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus before we consider the main features of its plot and also the features of Aaron the Moor, the villain in this play. Finally, most of my time is going to be focusing on Aaron's rhetoric, that is, his uh, manner of presenting what he wants and how he views his role, both in this play and in a more abstract sense, um, and what he wants out of this world, what he intends to do with the characters who are in this world. So firstly, this is a lesser known play by Shakespeare. Uh, and it is a tragedy. It's a tragedy uh, on a Roman subject. Titus Andronicus is like Julius Caesar or like Antony and Cleopatra in that it is one of Shakespeare's plays that focuses on, that is set in the imperial Roman era, that is during the Roman Empire uh, and at different phases of that empire's development. All of those plays have different aspects and different features of their plot, but Titus Andronicus is one that is certainly the bloodiest and the most violent, not just of the Roman plays, but really of any of Shakespeare's plays. I don't know if anyone keeps a death count or a running tally of how many people are dying in Shakespeare's plays, but Titus certainly would, if, that, if there were such a tally, would be somewhere near the top of that heap. Titus Andronicus has a central tragic figure in Titus Andronicus, the titular character. Uh, he uh, is one of the perpetrators of the revenge plot that he um, has to uh, enact so that he can get revenge against his enemies, namely... Tamora, the queen of the Goths, uh, Tamora's two sons, Demetrius and Chiron, and Saturnius, who is the emperor of Rome, marries Tamora and makes her his empress. I haven't mentioned Aaron yet. Aaron is, in fact, the lover of Tamora. He and Tamora and her sons arrive at the beginning of this play uh, as captives brought to Rome because they have been defeated. And this was a conventional, uh, conventional practice uh, in, in, among Roman generals that they would return after a military campaign in triumph. They would return with captives that were born through the streets, uh, carried through the streets on the, in um, carriages and cages and put on public display in order to be mocked, to be exhibited as the spoils of war, to be exhibited as the those who had resisted Rome's strength and been defeated for it, and now were being made an example of. 
I will avoid saying much more about the plot of Titus Andronicus at this stage, only because it'll certainly come up as we review speeches, uh, the speeches of Aaron in particular, and also because this uh, this presentation is not meant to give you a thorough, complete introduction to the entirety of this play. It's really just meant to give you a, an introduction to who Aaron is and how he fits into that story. One of the features that distinguishes Aaron from Richard of Gloucester, whom I discussed in my last episode, is that his motives for villainy are a little bit harder to discern sometimes. And this is also going to be true when we come to Iago. But Aaron is in some ways the most purely villainous villain that you get in all of Shakespeare. He seems to do many, many things purely for the sake, simply, of of wreaking as much hammock, havoc, causing as much uh, suffering to good people, to other people, to any people, uh, as he can. Now, he does have various motives that, uh, that we can go into uh, at various moments, but let's consider, for example, Act 3, Scene 1. And just to set the scene here, Aaron has arrived at Titus Andronicus's house. Titus is grief-stricken because his two sons, Martius and Quintus, have been taken away to be executed by the emperor for a crime that they were falsely committed, uh, falsely accused of. And Aaron arrives to say that to Titus with a, with a false promise of ransom. And he says to Titus, in line 150 following, he has a speech in which he says, I'll read it to you. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Titus Andronicus, my lord, the emperor sends thee this word, that if thou love thy sons, let Marcus, Lucius, or thyself, o old Titus, or any one of you, chop off your hand and send it to the king. He, for the same, will send thee hither both thy sons alive, and that shall be the ran ransom for their fault. And Titus is overjoyed and calls him gentle Aaron, is absolutely delighted by this. Um, Aaron, we suspect some foul play, but we have no reason to until he says an aside in which he effectively says that he is being deceptive. Uh, and he, this is moments before he chops off Titus's left hand. And, and then Aaron has this, this, uh, this brief speech before he leaves. And here it is, 199, uh, line 199 following in Act 3, Scene 1. I go, Andronicus, and for thy hand look by and by to have thy sons with thee. And then he says to the audience, their heads, I mean, oh, how this villainy doth fat me with the very thoughts of it. Let fools do good, and fair men call for grace. Aaron will have his soul black like his face. It is, frankly, not really Shakespeare's greatest moment, his best line, and, but it is Aaron reveling in his villainy and effectively saying to the audience, remember, I am a villain because my, my soul is black like my face. Now, we saw this a little bit with the episode on Richard but we will see it far, far more with the episode on Othello that is coming next. But the Elizabethan period was, shall we say, that anyone who didn't fit into the norms of, of being white and being able-bodied, just to pick two norms, for instance, was treated with a kind of suspicious contempt uh, and pushed and uh, shoved aside and alienated, such that Richard, for example, will constantly refer to the fact that he is um, has this physical deformity, uh, and people will constantly, in Othello, refer to the generals. Um, Othello is a Moor. He, they will constantly refer to the to the to the general's blackness uh, and as a matter of suspicion, as a matter certainly of comment, absolutely constantly. It is something that people simply can't let go. There was a very long tradition on the 
English stage in the 16th century of having villains depicted as the characters that uh, resemble the devil. In fact, having devils appear and literally personifying, often being called their, their characters' names being vice, that they would appear as vices and they would tempt, um, they would tempt main characters. They would certainly um, uh, deceive and flatter and manipulate and in every way possible uh, run, make sure that the, the, the trials of characters were as dramatic as they needed to be in order to get the story forward. So that, for example, a vice would come forward, uh, and we still talk this way, don't we? We say, um, I succumbed to my vices, um, and th that's in the, they're personified uh, on, the, on the 16th century stage. Um, as as actual figures, many of whom are, as I mentioned in the last episode, uh, are equated to the Machiavell, but also to the devil. And so at one point, Aaron actually makes reference to this. He's very much part of this tradition. The devil, by the way, was often depicted uh, in, in, in a, in a, with, a, with a black face. Uh, and so here's, De here's Aaron in Act 5, uh, scene one in which he has been captured and is is in the midst of making a very elaborate, very dramatic confession, uh, and he is accused of of rightly of being like a devil. He's called a devil, and Aaron's reply in lines one forty seven following is this: If there be devils, would I were a devil to live and burn in everlasting fire? So I might have your company in hell, but to torment you with my bitter tongue. And then he is gagged. He is um, an exquisitely articulate and embittered character. He is, in some ways, the most verbose and most interesting of all of the villains in Shakespeare. And you're about to find out why. When he is captured initially, we get a feeling or a sense that Aaron's villainy goes well beyond the bounds of this story that we have been watching or reading. He makes this extraordinarily full, declamatory self-confession. But first he offers to confess. This is Act 5, Scene 1, and he's just been captured by uh, he's he's been trying to escape and he is brought back um, by Titus Andronicus's son Lucius, and Lu he says to Lucius that if he were to confess everything, twelve acts thy soul to hear what I shall speak. Line sixty three, following Act five, scene one. For I must talk of murders, rapes, and massacres, acts of black night, abominable deeds, complots of mischief treason, villainies, ruthful to hear, yet piteously performed. It's a pretty impressive list. It's also, frankly, a bit um, less elaborate, I should say less sophisticated sounding than what we get a little bit later in that scene when he is, uh, he is made to confess all of what he has done and he as I say, it goes well, well beyond what's happened in this play. By the way, I, I, I recognize that at this moment uh, in th this episode, I haven't even said anything to you about what it is that Aaron has done, uh, really. Uh, we're going to come to that momentarily. We're, we're talking about his great confession because this sets up the character who he is. Then we'll look back at actually what it is that he truly does, uh, what it is that... Uh, we're, we're talking just at the moment about his, his origins his similarity to a vice figure, we're talking about his alienation, and then in a moment we'll talk about what it was that he, uh, that he was involved with, quite literally, in this play. But when he is brought down, they say to him, sorry, he, when he's captured, he, he's, he's uh, captured and brought toward Lucia, in front of Lucius, uh, and um, he is asked, are you not sorry for what it is that you've done? 
And this is what he says. He has, this is probably one of the most, um, most extraordinary speeches in, by any villain in any play. It's about line 124 following in Act 5, Scene 1. Are thou, are thou not sorry for these heinous deeds, says Lucius, and Aaron replies, I, that I had not done a thousand more. Even now I curse the day, and yet I think few come within the compass of my curse, wherein I did not some notorious ill, as kill a man, or else devise his death, ravish a maid, or plot the way to do it, accuse some innocent, and forswear myself, set deadly enmity between two friends, make poor men's cattle break their necks, Set fire on barns and haystacks in the night, and bid the owners quench them with their tears. Oft have I digged up dead men from their graves, and set them upright at their dear friend's door, even when their sorrow almost was forgot. And on their skins, as on the barks of trees, have with my knife carved in Roman letters, Let not your sorrow die, though I am dead. But... I have done a thousand dreadful things as willingly as one would kill a fly, and nothing grieves me hardly indeed but that I cannot do ten thousand more. A thousand dreadful things, well, well beyond the boundaries of this play. And the details that he gives... Um, the the details where he, he is it, it is a, a sort of listing out things that he has done, but he curses any day wherein I did not some notorious ill. He 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 resents no. He blames no. He wishes that he had spent every day doing these ills to other people like plotting to kill them, to rape or pl- a woman, or um, plot how to do that, to, to accuse someone falsely of a crime, to make two friends fall, fall into enmity, uh, etc., etc. And, the, and this, this, this extraordinary, vivid, horrendous image of how he went. <laughs> he says, not only has this, he done this once, he says, oft, Oft have I digged up dead men from their graves, and he's brought them out and put them where their friends can see them, just as they were beginning to forget their sorrow, to to let it abate, to let it diminish. He would carve on their skins, let not your sorrow die, though I am dead. He really exists then. He has been motivated utterly and entirely, if, if this is true and not just hyperbole, uh, he's been utterly motivated by causing misery, horror, enmity, um, ruin, <laughs> accusation, uh, etc., suspicion, all, all of the horrors, all of the crimes that have ever been committed. Uh, and he grieves that he can't do this 10,000 more times. He lives to be a villain. And right at the end of the play, one of the last speeches, when he, he is still defiant until the end, he is unrepentant right to the end. His ultimate crime, or sorry, rather, his ultimate punishment um, is literally for him to be um, set him breast deep in earth and famish him. Let, there let him stand and rave and cry for food, etc. So he, he's going to be buried in the earth so that he can't escape just up to up to his breast and with his arms free uh, or maybe not free I don't know but anyway, he's, he's going to be buried and, and not capable of digging himself out and let him starve to death it's a horrendous death that's his punishment this is act like 5 scene 3 and he doesn't um, he is unrepentant uh, line 183 he replies ah why should wrath be mute and furry du- fury why should wrath be mute and fury dumb? I am no baby, I, that with base prayers I should repent the evils I have done. Ten thousand worse than ever yet I did, would I perform if I might have my will. If one good deed in all my life I did, I do repent it from my very soul. So, enough of these broad statements of defiance. What is it exactly then that that Aaron does? What makes him so villainous in Titus Andronicus? 
Well, the main thing that he is capable of is taking the kind of um, taking the the clumsy, inadequate, um, amateurish, amateurish uh, uh, plots of others and turning them into something far more sophisticated and damaging. Uh, in Act Two, Scene One, Chiron and Demetrius, the two kind of vagabond idiot sons of of Tamara or Tamora, the Queen of the Goths, uh, decide that they have lust toward Lavinia. Lavinia is the daughter of Titus Andronicus, and there's going to be a hunt the next day, and they are sort of saying to themselves that they would really like to try to to woo her they would like they're plotting not to woo her they're they're they're, they're plotting to her rape uh, but they're they're being quite um disorganized and uh and impetuous etc they they have they're not very sophisticated about their their strategies well aaron says to them that look this is, what does he say? A speeder course must we pursue. I have found the path. I, he has got, he's got a better idea. He has then this idea of how, oh yes, they, they decided that, I'm sorry, they weren't actually plotting her rape. They, they're plotting how they could woo her. But as Demetrius has this lovely line, she is a woman, therefore may be wooed. She is a woman, therefore may be won. And he echoes there, perhaps, of Act 1, Scene 2 of uh, Richard III. Was any wo woman in this humor wooed? Was any woman in this humor won? Anyway, we, that was in the last episode. She is Lavinia, therefore must be loved. And so Demetrius and Chiron are squabbling amongst themselves about who gets to, to use their words to try to convince Lavinia to uh, surrender her chastity, her virtue to them. Aaron says, uh, strike you home, strike her home by force, if not by words, this way or not at all, stand you in hope. That's what he says in lines 119 following. And he then says, we should go to our empress. Tamora has been raised to the empress uh, because um, she and Saturnius, uh, Saturnius has been uh, become, become the emperor and he has chosen her as his wife. Come, our empress with her sacred wit to villainy and vengeance consecrate. Will we acquaint with all what we intend? And she shall file our engines with advice that we will not suffer you to square yourselves, but to your wishes height advance you both. The emperor's court is like the house of fame, the palace full of tongues, of eyes and ears. The woods are ruthless, dreadful, deaf and dull. There... Speak and strike, brave boys, and take your turns. There serve your lust, shadowed from heaven's eye, and revel in Lavinia's treasury. There's no ambiguity about what he's trying to say. He's saying, look, you, you can capture her, and then you can rape her. And it is far, far worse what they do to her when it comes to it. And Aaron has enabled and promoted and encouraged and shown them the way. And then he goes far further than that in order to orchestrate, arrange, uh, and uh, cover up uh, all the, the horrendous crime that they perpetrate against her. I'm going to spare you the details of what happens next. I will only say that Titus Andronicus is perhaps the play that is most preoccupied with the consequences of lust. Lust and desire. The desire for ha ravishing another person's body, but also, in some ways, the mutual desire of two people for each other. For instance, uh, Tamora and uh, Aaron have been having a love affair for the, the whole time this play has been going on. And the result is that when she has a child, whom many have simply assumed is the emperor's child, it is self-evidently Aaron's child. The nurse arrives in Act 4, Scene 2, and says and calls the child a joyless, dismal, black, and sorrowful issue, as loathsome as a toad amongst the fair-faced breeders of our clime. And the Empress has sent it to Aaron, she says, and bids thee christen it with thy dagger's point, i.e. kill the child. Is black so base a hue? asks Aaron. He disagrees. Uh, line 99 following. 
Coal black is better than another hue in that it scorns to bear another hue, for all the water in the ocean can never turn the swan's black legs to white, although she lave them hourly in the flood. He is full of sympathy, full of paternal love for this child, love and protection. This is a side of Aaron that only his child can bring out. We do not see it in any other relationship in this play. And in fact, Aaron's child is Aaron's pity for his child, his love for and concern for this child in a play that is all about, in addition to lust, also about parent-child relationships. That pity in Aaron is Aaron's undoing. It is what causes him to flee with the child and to be captured. Look at what he says. Going back to line Act 4, Scene 2, line 108, he calls it the vigor and the picture of my youth. This before all the world do I prefer. This maugre all the world will I keep safe. And he, because he feels a paternal a bond to, to another person that he has never, he's never felt until this, exact, until this moment. Uh, and line 120, look how the black slave smiles upon the father, as who would say, old lad, I am thine own. At the end of that scene, when Aaron flees with a child, we really get Shakespeare at his most prejudiced. Uh, his appalling prejudice is clear when he has Aaron say in lines 175 following, Come on, you thick-lipped slave, I'll bear you hence. He's speaking to the child. For it is you that puts us to our shifts. I'll make you feed on berries and on roots, and feed on curds and whey, and suck the goat, and cabin in a cave, and bring you up to be a warrior, and command a camp. Although he has quite um, paternal interests in this child becoming a warrior, we actually don't find out, I should say, by the end, at the end of the play, Unless I'm mistaken, we don't find out what actually happens to the child. Aaron is captured. The child is presumably killed uh, when Aaron is captured. Um, and when Aaron flees with him, he is showing a vulnerability that he doesn't show in any other relationship. And it seems appropriate that for a villain who is capable of saying such things about uh, his ambitions to murder and rape and pillage and defile and destroy so many other people when he says clearly that he is uh, has done crimes vastly beyond the realms of this the boundaries of this story for a villain like that to be undone by familial concern for this child is very appropriate in a play that is, as I say, about familial concerns, about parents and, and ancestors and families who are honor bound to act in certain ways, and parents who seek vengeance for their the crimes that are uh, enacted upon their children, and it's uh, a fitting end for a villain like Aaron to be undone by the kinds of things that also undo some of the good people in this play, namely Titus himself. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is the third in this three-part series on Shakespeare's villains, focusing on Iago, the quintessential arch manipulator from the tragedy Othello. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname, U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliot. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email. 
Elliot at ucalgary.ca. That's U C A L G A R Y.ca. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. <laughs>